Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you believe that Jesus is the center of your life, let me hear you say amen. amen. Okay, maybe you don't believe it. If you want Jesus to be a part of your life, let me hear you say amen. amen. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing else matters but the name of Christ. I don't care how clouded your mind is. I don't care how confused you might be. The only thing that matters in this moment and every moment of your life is Jesus Christ. Nobody cares about Samson. Nobody cares about anything. Everybody should care about Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's get into the word. Belonging come as you are. Come as you are. I am sure if you have an Instagram account or any form of social media, you've come across this quote. This is one of those quotes that is used to affect change in any area of your life. It is attributed to Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. and it says, if you cannot fly, run. If you cannot run, you should walk. If you can't walk, crawl, but whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. That sounds cute, it sounds uh, motivating, it's exciting and inspiring. Yes, never get stuck, always be moving. However, when it comes to your relationship with God, when it comes to your spiritual journey, when it comes to your hunger for righteousness and truth, there is no room for crawling or walking. You must run. Okay, you don't get it. That's all right. The call to come as you are, it's not come when you want. It's come as you are. The problem with our generation is we've taken this statement to say, take your time. Think about it. Consider it. Do your research. Jump from one religion to the other, one denomination to the other. And when you find the one that has the vibe, then you can become a believer. But the Bible does not introduce that idea. Everything about God is urgent. It says now. Now is the day of salvation. Now, today, if you've heard the call, respond. So don't crawl. Don't walk. Do what? Do what? Do, the, the guy who runs is saying run. What about everybody else? The urgency, brothers and sisters, in case you're conf confused, is not to be perfect. That's not the urgency. The urgency is to be in the presence of the one that can perfect you. Another challenge on the other side. You have a group of people who are not in a hurry. They're taking it easy. They stay in this lukewarm lane. But on the other side, you have people who are so obsessed with perfection that they impose it on other people. I'm here to walk the middle ground and tell you, the urgency is not to be perfect, but to come into the presence of a perfect God. He will make you perfect. By the way, I'm not canceling babies or old people. It's just an illustration. No crawling, no walking, run. That is a sermon today. Two days ago, there was a high-speed police chase in Sydney, Australia. A man and a woman had a car full of guns, probably high, out of their minds, and high on stupidity too. And so they were speeding through the streets of Sydney, trying to get away. Now, if it was back in the day where there were no drones and helicopters and cameras, they could get away with this. But in our generation, it is difficult to get away with anything because there are cameras everywhere. But I want you to use imagination for a second. What if, what if every city in the world had a place called Immunity Village, where if you ran a red light, robbed a bank, killed somebody, or committed a crime, if you made it, obviously they didn't make it, if you made it to Immunity Village, you could not be prosecuted. Can you imagine? Obviously, it wouldn't work in Jakarta, Clint, because of the traffic. Match it, match it, every day you'd be caught. I've been here for 10 years. I have not turned on the news and heard of any high-speed chase. 
Not once. So the moral of the story is, if you want to commit crime, go to Africa. So anyway, <laughs> if you manage to get to Immunity Village, you would not be prosecuted for your crime. But obviously that doesn't exist. But guess what? There was such an idea in the Bible. Let's go to the book of jo Joshua, chapter 20. I want to introduce you to the cities of refuge. In case you're wondering, the theme is belonging, come as you are. And as an installment in that theme, don't crawl, don't walk, run. This text will make sense. Open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 20. And I'm going to read from verse number one uh, to verse number nine. This will be the text that will help us understand what it means to belong and also how to develop a sense of urgency. God wants you in his presence more than you want to be in his presence. Out of all the gods and out of all the religions, the Christian God comes to where you are and invites you to be with him and to live and never be the same. Joshua chapter 20 verses 1 through 9. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I don't know these days. It's just got my attention. And then the Lord said to Joshua, when you read in Deuteronomy chapter 19, the Lord repeats the same thing to Moses. When you read Numbers chapter 35, the Lord repeats the same thing to Moses. In fact, it begins with Moses. Let's do this now. It begins with Moses. They've been wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. And if there's anything or any challenge that God had was to get the people of Israel out of a slave mindset and also out of doing things like the nations around them. So now and again in scripture, God always becomes or goes countercultural. I preached once upon a time the fact that every piece of land was under the name of a man. But there's a story where five daughters come and God gives them permission to have the land under their name. God continually, in the Old Testament pastor, challenges cultural thinking. This account is one of those moments where God challenges cultural thinking. Let me read the text. And then the Lord said to Joshua, Moses' prodigy, Say to the people of Israel, Appoint the cities of refuge of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the manslayer or murderer who strikes any person without intent or unknowingly may flee there. They shall be for you a refuge from the avenger of blood. Yes, Marvel did not come up with that. The Bible did. He shall flee to one of these cities and shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the city and explain his case to the elders of that city. Then they shall take him into the city and give him a place and he shall remain with them. And if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not give up the manslayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unknowingly and did not hurt him in the past, did not hate him in the past. And he shall remain in that city until he has stood before the congregation for judgment, until the death of him who is high priest at the time, then the manslayer may return to his own town and his own home, to the, to the town from which he fled. Now verses 7 to 9 tells us the names of these cities. Uh, pay attention because they mean something. And so they set apart Kadesh in Galilee, in the hill country of Naphtali, and Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and Kiriath Abba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. And beyond the Jordan, east of Jericho, they appointed Beza, some versions say Bozra, in the wilderness of the tableland, from the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth in Gilead, and from the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan, from the tribe of Manasseh. These were the cities designated for all the people of Israel, for all the strangers, 
sojourning among them, that anyone who killed a person without intent could flee there, so that he or she might not die by the hand, third time it has been said, the avenger of blood, till he stood before the congregation. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Don't crawl. Don't walk. Run. And so in Numbers and Deuteronomy, God gives Moses a clause that addressed a social problem that was not being met with civil solutions. He was the problem. In those days, there was no court system. There was what was known as the code of the avenger. Let me modernize this idea so you understand. Brother Jeff, you are out playing golf with your boys and you're about to swing the nine iron, it slips out of your hand and hits Brother Sutasa on the head and he dies. I, I don't want you to die, man. That's just an illustration, right? That's just an illustration. And, 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 and he dies. There was no time to call your wife and, and, and explain your actions. There was no time to call a lawyer. There was no time to call the pastor to pray for you. You had to get up and run to one of the closest cities of refuge. Ladies, you're out with your girls eating brunch. Your food is so good, you give one of your girls to taste it, she chokes on it, she dies. There's no time to tweet how sorry you are. you got to get up and run to the city of refuge. Dickie, you're playing Fortnite with your brothers. You get beaten, you get angry, you throw the controller, it hits somebody on the head, they die. There's no time to tick-tock. you got to run to the city of refuge. The reason God did this is because before that clause, anybody in the family assigned as the avenger, if somebody killed a relative, they had a right by society to kill. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So God is looking at his people. 40 years wandering in the wilderness, he realizes they are about to get into Canaan. And so preemptively, he says, when you separate the land out among the tribes, I want you to set aside six cities. These cities must have certain characteristics that will make them a place of refuge. Three people are involved in this issue when you get to the city of refuge. There is the accused, you and I. We are the accused, the sinner, the one who has committed a crime. But here's the thing, according to God's instruction, you had to have done it by mistake. No premeditated, planned, revenge, rage type of a crime. It had to be a mistake. An axe head comes off. A bucket of water, somebody slips down. Kids are playing tag. You push somebody, they die. Not intentional. And so that was the accused. The avenger was a member of the family, a friend, a leader, but it had to be somebody that represented the family. Let me slow down and say that sadly, believe it or not, this practice still happens today. There are certain countries in the world where people get stoned for committing either theft or adultery or anything that the community deems, and they get stoned by the relatives of whoever's been wronged. It still happens today as a form of justice. But God removes that and says, everybody deserves a chance and a day in court. And so you have the advocate. But here's the interesting thing about our generation and our walk with the Lord. The avenger is not the community. It's not your neighbors. It's not your haters. It's not your enemies. It's you. Your own mind has you running because of guilt and shame. It is you. And so the advocate in the story was not the high priest. It was elders and the congregation. My brothers and sisters, you decided the fate of somebody. You decided whether they belonged or did not belong. When they ran and arrived at the city, this is what it looked like. God told Moses and told Joshua that these six cities will be called cities of refuge. If you look at it geographically, you can tell that from any town, there's at least 25 kilometers or 15 miles, depending on where you come from, a distance for you to get to the closest city. 
God wanted to make sure that it did not take you too long to get there. God wants to make sure that the path between you and salvation is clear. God wants to make sure that you were able to see the place. So each and every city is up on a mountain or a hillside so you can see it from a distance. Ladies and gentlemen, in our generation, we don't have to run to a city. Jesus is wherever you can find him. When you call out his name, he is available. He is an ever-present help in trouble. Somebody say amen. And so these cities were accessible, accessible from anywhere. Another thing about these cities is that the roads that led up to the city had to be maintained. At every junction, every corner, every turn, there was a sign telling you where to go. And the people that maintained the cities were the Levites, the priest generation. They took care of the cities. It was their job to make sure that the highway was clear so that when people were running for life, if an accuser was running and an avenger was behind him, the path had to be clear. So that by the time you get to the city and you enter the gate, the avenger had no choice but to stand outside until your case was decided. Can you imagine if church boards functioned like this? Can you imagine if people were comfortable coming to the church and confessing their sins? Pastor, I took a bribe of five billion. Now I'm in trouble. Please pray for me. Okay, let me get the elders together and the deacons. Elders, here's the situation. He got greedy. He stole money. Let's back him up. Let's pray for him. Oh, yeah, but you, you, you know we don't do that. Right? You know we don't do that. Adventists, we don't eat meat, but we eat people. You know we don't do that. You know we'll call you out. You know we'll text and discuss you. We'll do everything but pray for you. But in those days, God said, it is your responsibility to help people find the path. And so... The city is up on a hill. The path is clear. Josephus is a Jewish historian who has a lot of records about the way things worked in the Hebrew culture. Some of them are accepted, some of them are challenged, but some of them are interesting. One of the things that Josephus says is that what used to happen because some neighbors were very vindictive. People would turn the signs around to face a different direction. Sometimes they would get rid of the signs. Sometimes they would lie to people so that they didn't make it. Sometimes they would take bribes in order for you to be able to get to the city. But the beautiful thing is, once you got to the city, the people in the city were rooting for you. Because remember, they too were in your situation. So there was no time if a thief a liar, a murderer, were running together. There's no time for the thief to turn to the murderer and say, ha, you're worse than me. How could you kill somebody? There's no time, Brother Glenn. you got to run. And when you are running, there's no time to judge. Our problem is we've stopped running. Now we're walking and chatting and looking around us. None of us are in the city, but we're judging each other. If you can't say amen, say ouch. And so you had to run. You had to run. Now somebody's thinking, how do you run 25 kilometers? Listen to me. When the adrenaline is flowing through your body, 25 kilometers is nothing. I've read stories of mothers lifting up cars because their child was trapped in there. So 25 kilometers is a lot now. Obviously not for Brother Glenn and Sister Nova and Pastor Henry, but for the rest of us, 25 kilometers is a lot. But if you've killed somebody and you're afraid... You will outrun everybody. I'm 11 years old. We are in my, my grandfather's place, the Kampung back home. And it is nighttime. So what we used to like to do is, at night, when the, especially when the moon was full, the, the path was so clear and beautiful. So we'd walk over to one of the fields to pick up mangoes. My grandfather had, has, he's passed away, a thousand mango trees in his land. So we'd go at night because it was fun, and, 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 and we could also drink without my dad being there, but it was fun, right? So we're walking on the path, and uh, two of my cousins are on donkeys because they live there, they're comfortable with that. All of a sudden, the donkey stops and refuses to move. 
And so they're trying to get this thing to move and it's not moving. All of a sudden, the donkey gets off the road and goes into the bush. One of my cousins looks across the road and he sees a snake's head come up. And everybody, because if there's, if there's one thing you don't know about the people where I come from, we, we are not curious people. When we hear a sound or something is strange, we don't go and say, what is this? No, no, Clint, <laughs> we, we run, you understand? Now I'm 11. Everybody else is older than me, but I can tell you right now, I outran all of them, all the way home. And when I look back, I didn't see anybody. Why? Because I was scared. So I'm telling you that 25 kilometers is nothing when you are on the run. In a perfect world with a perfect justice system, you are innocent until proven guilty. Now, if, if I wanted, I could have simply said, in our justice system, you are innocent and proven guilty, but we know the reality of that. They with money, they without, you are treated differently, okay? If you can't afford it, you might go to jail for something you never did. If you can, you go free. That's the world we live in. But if the world was perfect and the justice system was perfect, you would be innocent until proven guilty. However, in God's justice system, you are guilty until proven innocent. Now somebody will be like, wait, uh, I thought the lesson study we were told about the grace of God. Here's the thing. We are born and shapen in iniquity. We are born running. We are born sinners. We are born with this innate possibility to sin, and eventually we do. Look at a two-year-old. Look at a 16-year-old. Look at a 60-year-old. We have the potential and we have fulfilled it to be sinners. But here's the beautiful thing. God wants everybody to be innocent. How does he do that? I want to quickly look at each city, very quickly, look at the name and see how each name reflects what God is trying to do. The first city at the top is Kadesh. By the way, in between is the River Jordan. On the inside of the land, you had three cities. On the outside, you had three. Because what God said to Moses and to Joshua Everybody has access to those cities, not just the Hebrew people, even the Canaanites, the Egyptians, the Ninevites, whoever it was, whatever stranger, they could not even belong to any tribe or speak the language. If they committed a crime or a mistake and they ran to the city, they had a right to be heard. Because when it comes to God's house, God said to Isaiah, my house shall be called a house of prayer, not just for my people, but for all nations. So if you are sitting in here and you feel uncomfortable because you are not a certain religion or a certain denomination, you are welcome. Okay, turn to somebody and say to them, you are welcome. If a husband turns to a wife and says you're welcome, that's for dinner last night when you didn't say thank you. Kadesh, Kadesh, that's an, uh, some, some version will say uh, K K Kadesh or Kadesh, uh, some would put an E, but Kadesh means a holy place or righteousness. So if you are running, headed towards Kadesh, and you saw the sign that said, come as you are, welcome to the city of righteousness, your mind would tell you that I am unrighteous, I am unworthy, but the one that is inviting me is worthy because brothers and sisters, we don't function through our own righteousness. We function through the righteousness of Christ. Isaiah says, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Not a, not a dirty cloth. Not a garment that's used to clean the floor. The implication, and I apologize in advance, the implication is the, the, the cloth that the women would use at that time of the month. He's comparing that bloody garment, Clint, as the righteousness of believers. So it doesn't matter how good at preaching or singing or giving or smiling or being there for people you are, your righteousness means nothing. Each of us must run into the city of righteousness. Because the righteousness of Christ gets you where you need to get. Without him, you are nothing. There's nothing you can do to be good. It is God. And the second city, Shechem, it meant shoulder. Our God is our strength. Our God 
is the one we lean on. He is a right hand. He is a righteous right hand holds you up. When you go through seasons of life where you feel pressed down, he lifts you up. When you go through seasons where the world is beating you up, he, he lifts you up. When you go through life losing everything left and right, God says, I got you. You can lean on my shoulder. I got you. I love you. I am your God. And so if you feel weak and abandoned, make your way to Shechem because Jesus is waiting. Amen, somebody. Maybe it's not righteousness that you need. Maybe it's not a shoulder to lean on. Maybe it's fellowship. You've been wandering so long by yourself. You've tried to do it on your own. You've tried to do it without the people of God. But now you're saying, Lord, I need fellowship. I need companions. The Lord says, come on over to Hebron because there, there is fellowship. There's togetherness. We love one another. We don't judge you, but we hold you accountable. Anybody here need fellowship? I do. Anybody here need people to pray for them? I do. Anybody need people to encourage them? I do. Because without fellowship, we might not make it. And so you run uh, to Reban. Maybe you want to go to, to Golan, right? You want to go to Golan to find joy. Your life is filled with bitterness and anger. You are surrounded by people that suck the energy vampires, that suck the joy out of your life. You've been coming to church, but you're not happy. You've been married, but you're not happy. You've been running a business, but you're not happy. You're studying, but you're not happy. You have family, but you're not happy. And you're saying, Lord, I am desperate for joy. God says, come over to Golan where you will find joy. Weeping men do for the night by joy comes in the morning, the Lord says. Maybe it's not joy that you need. Maybe it's exaltation. The Bible says the humble will be elevated and the proud will be pushed down. Maybe you feel that you've been doing everything you can to work and produce results and nobody sees it. Nobody praises you. You're not getting the promotion. You're not getting the, 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 the accolades and the recognition. God says, come to me. I will exalt you. Amen, somebody. Maybe it's Basra that you need. Maybe you need the Lord to protect you. The enemy has been coming in and you're saying, Lord, please shut the door, shut the windows, put up a high wall, put an electric fence. I don't need the enemy coming in anymore. The Bible says the Lord is my fortress. The Lord is a stronghold. So can you imagine being a part of this nation? You had access to all these cities. You had a chance to be heard. You had a chance for your day in court. One more thing, and I'll be done. So I told you at the beginning that there are three people involved. The accused, the avenger, called the avenger of blood, and also the advocate. The accused is the one who has committed the crime or made the mistake. The avenger is the family member. But the advocate was the congregation. The people in the city decided whether you came in or whether you we're not allowed to come in. If they heard your case and realized that you were lying and you actually did commit the crime, Deuteronomy chapter 19 says, you can be handed over to the avenger of blood and they had a right to kill you. But if they heard your case, I want everybody to catch this. If they heard your case and you were found innocent of intentional murder, you had to live in the city. There was no chance of being bored. No matter how bored you got, you had to stay inside. No matter how old-fashioned the city got, you had to stay inside. If every other city started using Wi-Fi and electricity and all they had was candles and, 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 and scrolls, you had to stay inside the city. So no matter how bored you got and you didn't like your neighbor or you didn't like the way they looked at you or you didn't like how they dressed, you had to stay in the city. There could have been people who of a different language or culture that you didn't understand, but you had to do what? You had to do what? You had to do what? I got all day. You had to do what? You had to stay in the city. I get it. Church gets boring sometimes. The preacher's sermons get boring sometimes. Sometimes the preacher's so angry and he's calling out your sins. Sometimes people don't want to talk to you. People are not friendly. People are talking about you. But God says, stay inside the city. Sometimes your problems are so many, you want to give up. You want to jump ship. But God says, the only time you could leave 
is when the serving high priest died. It was the death of the high priest that set you free. Is somebody with me? It was the death of the high priest. The moment he died, the avenger could not do anything to you. Now you could get out of the city and go home. Now sadly, in those days, they lived forever. The high priest could die at 100 or 110, but you had to stay inside the city because it's safer inside. But once the high priest died, he no longer, the, the, the avenger could not kill you. But here's a, an interesting thing I found. I, I'm going to praise the Lord by myself if I have to, but this was amazing. In the text in the Hebrew, the word for avenger of blood is translated once in the book of Ruth as kinsman redeemer. So the avenger of blood had to redeem the family name by killing the person that killed somebody in their home. But in the book of Ruth, when Ruth hooks up with Boaz, Boaz pays her debts and he brings her in close. He became her kinsman redeemer. So he didn't kill her, he paid her debt. So that means Jesus is also the avenger of blood. But instead of killing you, he allowed himself to be killed on your behalf. I, I, I don't know whether it's because socially you are comfortable or mentally you are challenged or your life is so messed up that you didn't hear what I just said. That you didn't get to pay the price, Jesus paid it for you. Forget Thor. Forget Iron Man. Forget Je forget. Forget Jesus. Forget all those Avengers. Jesus is the original Avenger of blood. So, instead of lifting up stones to stone you, Jesus lifted up his hands and he was nailed on a cross. So if ever you feel that you don't belong, run to the cross. There you will see Jesus hanging for your sins. But don't stay there. Go to the tomb. It is empty because he walked out. He is not a high priest that can die, but he's a high priest who is touched by the feelings of infirmities. And now he lives forever as a kinsman redeemer because it doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus paid the price. I know it is easy for people to make you feel like you don't belong. If there's any gift that human beings have is to be destructive. We don't like peace. We love problems. And sometimes we love to share those problems. So if you're happy, I want to take that away from you. But the Lord says, I want you to be like Kadesh, Golan, Ramoth, Gilead, Hebron. I want you to be a congregation that is accountable. When somebody walks in, I want to know, what have you done? You share your crime, I'll share mine. And I've said it for a decade. I love Jakarta Central Church because in here is a bunch of convicts who are running. We are all here running from something, but we are running to Jesus. Can somebody say amen? If you've got family members who are tired of their church, tell them to come over. Come as you are, but don't leave the same. If you left the city of refuge and the high priest has died, this time when you go home, you will be careful. The next time you play golf, you'll make sure that you, you hold on to that club before you swing. The next time you go for brunch, your plate is your plate, my plate is my plate. Okay? You play Fortnite, Dickie, you can play again. No need to throw the controller. Okay, maybe you don't like Fortnite. Maybe you're a Tekken guy. GT, okay, nobody cares. All right, come as you are. Don't leave the same. Stop coming for worship. Stop coming to the sermon and spewing out amen because the pastor said so. But you leave this place not redeemed. You got to leave different than when you came. That offer is available for the one who's been here for 20 years and the one who just walked in. We serve the same God. Heads bowed, eyes closed. You know me, I end my sermons <clears throat> abruptly. I'm done. Let us pray. Let us pray. Oh God, I hope I have not stood here pretending to be an avenger of blood because I don't qualify. Like everybody else in this room, I'm running. I'm on the highway making my way to the city. I'm on my way looking for something that only Jesus can give. And I thank you because the people in the city are waiting for me to come. The Bible says every time one soul comes to the Lord, heaven rejoices. 
So if nobody in this room is excited, at least I know in the new Jerusalem, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and all the angels of heaven are excited to see me running to the city. Jesus said, if you get tired on the way, I'll strengthen you. Jesus said, if you get confused about the directions, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, if you feel alone, I got you. Sometimes I'll run beside you. Sometimes I'll carry you. Sometimes we will run together. Whatever it is, I'll make sure you make it. And until Jesus comes, all of us are running. Some of us are running from debt. Some of us are running away from blood money. Some of us are running away from a, heart, a, a lie that we have kept in our hearts. Some of us are running with the guilt and the shame of the things we've done. Some of us have not killed somebody physically, but we've emotionally scarred them for life. But as long as we are running to and not just from, each of us will make it. There's a sister, Lord, who is going to be baptized. We pray for her. She has found the city. But I believe that there's somebody else in this room that has been running, but they've been running away. I pray that they will turn around, do a 180, and start running towards Christ because He has an offer of grace for them. May we never take your grace for granted, but at the same time, may we take advantage of every drop of it so that we may be found in the city of refuge. And now, Lord, I pray, may you be above us to watch over us. May you be beneath us to lift us up when we fall. May you walk ahead of us to guide us in the way. May you walk behind us that we would never go astray. May you indeed surround us to protect us like the city of refuge every single day. But above all things, may you find a place in our hearts so that we may experience righteousness, exaltation, joy, elevation, and all the things that the cities have to offer. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Let everybody say amen. God bless you.